It's all for this man. Right, Some Yang Gangers out there, love it. There's a lot of overlap, I've noticed, the crypto folks and Yang folks. Yeah, I've noticed the same thing. <laughs> so I, it seems like a lot of you know who Mr. Yang is, but maybe some of you don't. So I figured we'd just start this off with uh, you just kind of talking about what you're trying to do. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Andrew Yang. I'm running for president in 2020. And I just qualified for the Democratic primary debate, so I'll be one of 10 uh, candidates who's up on the stage. Uh, and if you've heard anything about me, you've heard there's an Asian guy running for president who wants to give everyone $1,000 a month. And all of those things are true. Um, I'm championing a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for every American adult starting at age 18. And I have to say, I found a ton of alignment with the cryptocurrency community because anyone I talk to in the cryptocurrency community has a mindset of abundance and optimism and the future and are trying to make uh, things happen. And you all see that if Americans were receiving a dividend of $1,000 a month, we could replace this mindset of scarcity that is sweeping our country and tearing communities apart and get their heads up. Um, so when I realized that alignment, I was like, no wonder I like all my friends who are into crypto. Uh, and uh, this idea now, I'm happy to say, has brought me to the debate stage, uh, brought thousands of people out in the rain last night here in New York. Uh, and I wouldn't be where I am without uh, the internet getting behind me. So I was introduced as the internet candidate, and that's a label I'm very, very happy to wear proudly. Uh, so I would probably get in trouble if I didn't start off asking, of course, about the, the memes that have emerged to support you. Yes. Uh, what's that been like? I mean, there's Yang Gang. I heard some of that. I don't see any of the neon hats out here, which is a little, or vaporwave Oh, you hat. know they have them. They just didn't bring them. I see one Yang hat. And then there's like the, the math hat. Uh, the, my favorite memes are the music. Uh, there's like the Do the Math song by Paperboy the Prince. Uh, like, uh, I play these songs and memes for my kids at home. Um, and uh, it cracks them up that someone's putting their dad's face on uh, dragons and, uh, and, and various other memes. Uh, so the meme army has come out for our campaign from, early, uh, from the early days. And it's one of the reasons we went viral earlier this year after I appeared on the Joe Rogan podcast. And uh, so speaking of the math meme, uh, that seems like one that you've really embraced. What does that mean? Well, it stands for Make America Think Harder. Um, uh, but it's also an applause line uh, that the opposite of Donald Trump is an Asian man who likes math. Uh, and so but between those two things, uh, we, we actually were testing it out. We weren't sure. So we said, let's sell 500 math hats, like just one printing, if you will. And it sold out in 22 minutes. Uh, and so then we're like not being idiots. We're like, I guess people like the math hat. And so now <laughs> that's yeah. a regular item. And, uh, um, we, we now have a swag business uh, for the campaign that uh, is a multi-million dollar swag business uh, annualized, which is something certainly I never could have anticipated. Um, you know, there, there's like swag with like an animated me and like math and math hats and everything else. Uh, so, uh, but you know, I'm an entrepreneur and, and we go with whatever the market tells us to do. Uh, one thing the market told me that you should do is sell the Vaporwave pink hats, because I had to buy mine bootleg. Yeah, the market did say to do that. <laughs> and, and that's one of the, the few things we did not listen to the market on, uh, because that there was like this perception that, um, that the pink Vaporwave hats, despite looking hella cool, um, you know, might mean that we were uh, embracing people with uh, an ideology of uh, you know, extremity that um, people were concerned that we, we didn't necessarily want to, to have the campaign uh, have that association for so many people. Oh, well, the, that doesn't mean that to me, I guess. No, it doesn't mean it to me either. I mean, close friends of mine like have the pink vapor, vaporwave hat. And you know, like, when I first saw the design, I was like, this is really cool. Like, who came up with this? Like, they deserve royalties. Uh, and then the fact that we couldn't make them um, was actually a point of pain for me and several people on the campaign team. And we, we actually had an open mind the whole time. We still have an open mind. Um, so it, you know, it could be that someone who buys the pink vaporwave hat might be buying it from the campaign at you know, some point in the future. Uh, so tell us, you mentioned the freedom dividend, $1,000 a month uh, for every American. Uh, I guess the first question that I always hear is, where, where would the money come from? What's the plan? Well, the, the great thing about what I call the trickle-up economy is that if we put this money into Americans' hands, the money doesn't disappear. It's going to get spent in communities repeatedly. 
Uh, so we're going to get some of it back in economic growth and new tax revenue from the fact that you'd be growing the consumer economy uh, by about 10 to 12 percent. Uh, the second thing is we'd save direct costs on things like incarceration, homelessness services, emergency room health care, and things that we spend hundreds of billions on. Uh, and there's a prison guard in New Hampshire, very politician-y sounding of me, but it's like there's a prison guard in New Hampshire who said that we should pay people to stay out of jail because it's so expensive when they're in jail. Uh, and so we could save tens, hundreds of billions uh, uh, on things that we're spending money on right now. And the third thing is that by alleviating poverty, you would improve physical health, mental health, uh, graduation rates go up, you'd be creating a more enterprising and entrepreneurial and creative culture. There's at least one study that said that if you were to alleviate poverty in this country, you would increase GDP by $700 billion just on the basis of better health and education outcomes. So you get a lot of money back uh, immediately. It's much less expensive than people believe. But the big move that we do need to make, uh, in my opinion, is that right now, companies like Amazon are paying zero in federal taxes, despite the fact that Amazon's a trillion dollar company that uh, is now causing 30% of malls and stores to close. Uh, and that's not sustainable. So the, the way that we should uh, fix that is join the rest of the developed world and have a value added tax uh, that would then take a tiny, tiny sliver of every Amazon sale, every Facebook ad, return it to the American people in the form of this dividend. And because the American economy is now so vast at $20 trillion plus, uh, even a mild value added tax on companies like Amazon would raise uh, hundreds of billions of dollars. So in those four ways, you can pay for a dividend of $1,000 a month. It's much more affordable than people believe. Uh, so I actually went to your rally in D.C. I think about a month ago. Oh, yeah, it was a good rally, man. I'm glad you were there. Okay, it was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, a beautiful day. Uh, pretty good attendance, I got to say. And uh, one thing that I, you mentioned a lot is this data is the new oil uh, thinking. So what did you mean by that? Well, I draw a comparison to the fact that there's one state um, that's had a dividend for almost 40 years where everyone in that state now receives between one and two thousand dollars a year. No questions asked. It's wildly popular. It's created thousands of jobs. Uh, and that state's Alaska. And they instituted in 1981. Now they pay for it with oil money. And what I've suggested to the American people is that data, software, AI, robotics, um, technology is the oil of the 21st century. So it's not just data, though data is obviously an enormous part of it, uh, but it's AI and these other advances that are coming down the pike. And the danger right now is that the, United, that the people, uh, like random person in Missouri, like is he or she going to benefit from AI? Un unclear. They certainly might not feel like they're going to. Uh, and so we need to create some mechanism where we don't have a majority of our people take a very negative attitude towards progress, which unfortunately you can tell right now is happening in various parts of the country. And as a numbers guy, the dynamism of the economy is concentrated in 20 counties in the United States. Not the top 20% of counties, 20 counties. And if you look at the rates of business formation uh, and economic growth and even interstate migration, they've all gone off a cliff in the vast majority of the communities. And so their attitude towards progress is darkening quickly. And one of the things I say to folks who are in your community, who are in our community, uh, that that's a bad environment for innovation for all of us. Like if you have the majority of your people who don't think that they're included in uh, the new economy, then it's going to become a much more hostile environment for innovators, entrepreneurs, and people at the forefront. So I guess we should probably address the fact that you're at a cryptocurrency conference. <laughs> I noticed that. Yeah. I don't know if you've had there was a, a There was a giant uh, gold coin when I walked in. It yeah. was like a uh, that, that clue. person comes to everything. Uh, oh, wait, what are the other hallmarks of a cryptocurrency conference? Let, let's, uh, uh, last year was a little <laughs> crazier, <laughs> put it like that. Uh, oh, the, the good thing is a bounce back. There's been a bounce back, right? Uh, I've been told, yes, the price has re recovered. Uh, so I was actually <laughs> speaking of, I was looking at your past tweets, and uh, you first tweeted about Bitcoin in 2013. It was a reaction to the price dropping to 500. It, was, it wasn't mean, don't worry, you were, you were very neutral. Uh, but uh, what do you think about kind of the last five years from what you've just seen? Uh, what a roller coaster ride it's been the last five years. I mean, geez. Um, you know, there was a long period where anyone who got into Bitcoin 
uh, just saw it compound and compound, and like you know, if you bought in at some like double digit or triple digit number, you were a freaking genius. And I, I have many friends who, at some point along the the line, they said like you know, this has gone even better than I would have expected, so I'm just going to sell. And then most of them had misgivings because the prices kept on rising um, a after they'd sold. Uh, and so, and then there was the crash, uh, obviously, and then people were questioning whether um, it was going to come back, and now it's made a, a lot of a bounce back. Um, certainly, for, for me, having friends who are in the industry, uh, it's, I mean, um, it, it's been, uh, to me, an education, um, watching the last five years, um, participating in some tiny way, uh, that there is, I mean, the, the lens I have towards it is, is for many other technologies, that the underlying technology has immense potential um, and then whether or not that potential is getting realized right now is going to be reflected in the trading value of something like Bitcoin or Ether. Uh, probably not. You know, it's like, like that's not the way these cycles go. It's like the, the, um, the value tends to outstrip the application for a while, and then there's a correction, and then the underlying value then catches up, and then at some point in the future, it winds up uh, rising in a very robust and sustainable way. Um, so that's what I imagine um, is happening here. Um, but there are people in this room that are, are, have been uh, li like eating, sleeping, and breathing it to a much higher degree than I have. Uh, one of the great No, don't eat, sleep, and breathe it too much. <laughs> Every once in a while, go on a hike. <laughs> I should probably do that. Uh, so, <laughs> it's my coworker laughing at me. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <laughs> so. I've noticed that you kind of uh, grew from this sort of outsider media world, right? Uh, you, I believe, were on the Joe Rogan podcast, which is when you really exploded onto the scene. So how does that strategy work for you? And what does it mean that kind of you can go around the traditional gatekeepers to create uh, some momentum? Yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of skepticism for the mainstream media at this point. Um, I don't know. Let's try this. How many of you get your news from cable news? I thought it'd be zero. Wait, wait. Maybe Chuck. <laughs> I thought it'd be virtually nobody. Um, and that's the norm. You know, it's like, you know, and so you have these media gatekeepers that have actually lost uh, a lot of their clout. Um, I mean, if you look at the traffic numbers, Joe Rogan's podcast uh, gets seen or heard by something like 10 times. Uh, the traditional cable news cast. Um, I did a town hall on CNN. Uh, you know, it probably got seen between half a million and a million times, maybe more after video clips and the rest of it. Uh, Joe Rogan is probably 10 to 12 million. So, uh, so knowing that there's immense power in the hands of some non-traditional uh, media outlets, not to call Joe a media outlet, because he's just a man. He's just a man in a man hanger uh, in in LA with his float tank and his uh, werewolf, his two gyms, sports car, gymnastics tumbling mat. So, so you, you, know, you, you realize that people are getting their information from varied sources. Uh, and this is exactly the way I love the arc of this campaign, where we like grow based upon um, people finding out about us from uh, their friends or a podcast or you know, maybe a crypto news clipping. Uh, uh, and then we grow and grow to a point where the mainstream can't ignore us. Like, that's the ideal path that, that we wanted, and that's the path we're on. Uh, and it might not have been possible in another era where there was no Joe Rogan uh, experience. So not only outsider media, but I also, you're getting some kind of outsider data on your campaign, because at the rally, that day, a poll had come out showing that you were at 3%, which was very impressive. 3% uh, nationwide, baby. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, right. But the, the woman who was leading the rally uh, mentioned that the internet put you at 7%, which I think was a reference to predict it, the sanctioned prediction market. Uh, yeah, and, and predict it reflects people actually putting money to work. Yeah, and now you're at 10%. Now so. I'm at 10%? Nice. Yeah, so. <laughs> Some, yeah. Someone made some money, or maybe the opposite. So I made some money. Yeah. So go ahead and uh, buy, and then I'll say something really smart tomorrow, and then it'll go up. <laughs> it's not collusion if it's public. So 
Yeah, it's not front row. <laughs> and uh, then I'll say something really dumb next week, <laughs> cause a dip, and you can jump in at six. <laughs> I'll recant the following week. We can all in this room make a lot of money. So if I, uh, I don't typically make cryptocurrency price predictions because I have no idea what, what's going on with that, but if I had to guess, the next, the Yang pump will come after the debate, which you've qualified for. Yeah, so uh, what I say is millions of Americans are going to tune in that night, June 26th, and they're going to ask that question, who is the Asian man standing next to Joe Biden? <laughs> they're then going to Google Asian man standing next to Joe Biden. They're going to find Andrew Yang. They're going to say, wait a minute, this is real? I heard something about this guy. He wants to give everyone a thousand bucks a month. And they're going to realize that sounds better to them than just about anything anyone else is talking about. And then the Yang Gang will just grow and grow. And I've got two bites at it because I've qualified for not just the Democratic primary debates in June, but also in July. So I've, I've got two national debates. I'm also going to be on Bill Maher, Stephen Colbert, NBC Nightly News. It's just going to grow and grow. That's the beauty of this, this campaign, is that is that people initially are like, wow, that's interesting, but that can never happen. But then as it becomes a real option, then it, like, the momentum is going to be unstoppable. It's going to be so much fun because the, the conventional media is not, not going to know what the heck is happening. I mean, they, they already don't know what is happening. I'm out polling half a dozen sitting senators and governors, and they don't know what to make of that. Like, I'm going to South Carolina this weekend. I'm at 3% there. I've never been to South Carolina. Yeah. People love that bag. Everyone can talk about anything but the bag, and they're going to lose to the bag. Uh, when you add in the predicted factor, this kind of sounds like a cryptocurrency pitch. It's going to go up true. and up, that's and the that's momentum's true. going. And we, were, we were looking at a Yang coin for a little while. <laughs> Don't do that. Uh, it's, not too, it's not too late. Yeah, the, the Yang uh, coin. Uh, given that my work deals with securities law and cryptocurrencies, I'm going to say, please do not do that. So speaking of the cryptocurrency policy stuff, uh, a couple weeks ago your campaign rolled out a remarkably forward-thinking cryptocurrency policy, uh, which I think many of the people who are building businesses in this room have run into problems with, like uh, complicated taxation, yeah, uh, lack of guidance from the IRS. Uh, I bet your accountants want to kill you. Yes, I think every, yeah, raise your <laughs> hand if you enjoyed the tax process this year. Yeah, that was kind of a weighted question, I know. but. Uh, and then, uh, so kind of how, uh, how did you get to a point where you decided that this was important enough to weigh in on? Well, again, I have many friends in the community, and, uh, and to me it really does harken to past uh, technology cycles where it's very, very hard to invest and innovate um, if you don't know what the heck the regulatory landscape's going to look like, if you've got multiple agencies who may or may not have a say uh, in what you're working on, if uh, you're not sure if there's going to be a state what a nightmare it would be to have a state-by-state -state framework. I mean, someone shoot me in the head if that's what happened. You know what I mean? That's, so That's what we have now. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I know. I was, I was uh, you know, looking into the Wyoming uh, regs, which is like a really sort of heartwarming story how that came about. Um, but so as a, a builder and innovator, like that environment sounds like one of the worst of all possible scenarios. So if, if you're... A builder, you're just like, look, just tell me what the heck the, the landscape's going to look like, and I can figure it out from there. But as it is, no one knows what the landscape's going to be. So we owe you all some clarity, some visibility and transparency so that you know uh, the environment you're operating in. And if you don't have that, then shocker, other countries will end up being um, more on the forefront of this technology wave. And there is so much immense potential to the blockchain. I mean, one of the ideas I have that I'm not allowed to talk about in any other setting but this one, so it's a joy for me, uh, is that, so uh, freedom dividend, $1,000, it's going to be in dollars. But then if you look at what the structural problems are moving forward in an era where we're going to automate away retail, call centers, fast food, truck driving, like the most common jobs in the society, the, the real void, which we're already struggling with by the numbers, um, is a struggle for purpose, fulfillment, meaning, structure, things that work and community used to provide. And men in particular deal with idleness very, very poorly. 
Um, by the numbers, we play a lot of video games. Uh, we start uh, doing a lot of uh, drugs and alcohol. Uh, we volunteer less than employed men, even though we have more time. Um, this is surprising to none of the women in this room. Um, and women deal with idleness very differently in that women are never actually idle. Like women just let, you know, find awesome things to do uh, and go back to school at higher levels. So, so this is the generational challenge of this time. And so putting money into people's hands does not magically reconstitute society. Uh, but one of my ambitions is to have a currency that would most likely be on the blockchain that then maps to things that people find meaningful. Um, so you could end up inducing more volunteerism, uh, more arts and creativity, more civic engagement, uh, more coaching, more things that we need to help reconstitute that structure of purpose and fulfillment that many Americans had in a previous era, in an era where we are going to decimate the most common livelihoods. Uh, driving a truck is the most common job in 29 states. There are three and a half million truckers in this country, and, and we have probably all have friends in this room who are working on autonomous vehicles. So what happens when trucks can drive themselves? What happens to those three and a half million American men? And then there are an additional two million or so who are driving Ubers and, and limos and Lyfts and the rest of it. So we have our work cut out for us, and I believe the blockchain is one of the key technologies that could help us uh, construct uh, an economy that would actually stand the test of time in the 21st century that integrates both meaning and what we currently consider monetary value. So I'm not allowed to talk about that in any other setting than this one. Um, because my campaign team was like, that is so uh, over people's heads. Um, but in this context, I, I have a feeling it's spot on. Um, because many of you have actually already uh, experienced some of these things yourselves. Like when you had the run up, and then you started seeing all these people around you uh, that are like working every day for what seems like, you know, I mean, I, I, we have no minimum wage in this country is like, you know, it's like 10 bucks an hour or less um, in, in some contexts. And so you see it and you're like, wow, like, you know, what could we be doing differently? Uh, that is something that we have, like this, in many ways, this community, it's why I love being here with you all. You all are like the vanguard of the evolution of the species. Um, and we really do not have that much time to evolve because like there's an evolution and a devolution that are unfortunately happening in different segments of our society. And we need to come together and then try and uh, try and correct the de-evolution as fast as possible. Was that too much? Uh, you fit in perfectly here, it seems. Uh, so kind of going back to the data is the new oil thing, because I just had a thought about that. Uh, if companies are making most of their money in the future on monetizing our data, a lot of co people and companies in this room and the projects that they're building are designed to actually uh, prevent, to, to deliver the same services in a way that the data is never shared. So rather than maybe tax yeah, somebody, yeah, for, yeah, yeah. yeah. So how, how do you feel about that kind of the data privacy kind of uh, conversation that's happening? You know, it, it's really interesting. Uh, maybe it's uh, because I'm Asian, um, but you see. A country like China has sort of a lax attitude towards privacy, and then, uh, and then they pretty much, everyone gives up their data for convenience. Some people might have a different preference, but that's more or less the norm. And then the US, we, pr we pretend that the data is yours, but really there are all these companies <laughs> that are like using it and reselling it and like doing all these things. Uh, and, then, uh, and then you all are working on applications to truly protect the uh, data. Uh, so I tried to run the numbers on what a data dividend would look like for Americans when I was trying to figure out how to fund universal basic income. And right now, a data dividend would be relatively modest in terms of amount of money per citizen per month. Um, now, that, that, that total is definitely going to grow in the times to come. Um, but to me, it's a fundamental challenge uh, how we're going to treat data in the American economy. Because uh, right now, we're essentially pretending everyone still has their privacy and then there's this monetization layer that's happening on top of us. And in the healthcare industry in particular, our, our data um, is very valuable. It can get sold for hundreds of dollars like per period, um, sometimes more. And so the ideal vision, which would be difficult to execute, would be that we could actually express our data preferences and then have uh, different things happen to us based upon what we wanted to do. So you could say, you could like turn off 
your data and just say like, hey, I'm anonymous, and then your life becomes more inconvenient, um, but no one knows what you're doing. Or you could turn your preference up to like, hey, I'm an open book, and then all of a sudden, uh, like all the ads are relevant and like, you know, all the messages finish themselves, <laughs> messages finish themselves. Uh, and maybe even you get a tiny slice of the money, maybe. Like if there are companies that are profiting from your data. So this is one, one detail I found really interesting. Your anonymous healthcare data is worth this much. If you were willing to personalize your data, it's actually worth this much. Like if they actually can confirm that all these details about you are correct and ask you questions, your data actually becomes more valuable. So it's possible that if you decided to go to open book, then you could actually be financially rewarded. So that would be ideal in my mind, that we could express our preferences in these ways, uh, but that'd be very, very difficult to execute. Yeah, the open book thing kind of scares me. Like imagine if uh, you paid for some unhealthy meal with Venmo, which I do often, and then your insurance company has bought your finance data from Venmo or some equivalent, and then it charges you more because they know you went back for that second whatever ice cream. That would be unfortunate. Yeah. I'm with you, man. <laughs> Uh, then, of course, there's the authoritarian abuses of data, too, uh, which we could probably do a whole session on. Yeah, yeah, we could. Um, well, so I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to the members of this community who want to uh, have more of these transactions occur in a non-monitored uh, environment or context. Uh, I think that's a very healthy impulse. So you started kind of your life, or your campaign online, not your life, I hope. Actually, no, I don't know, because no. you talked about that hologram. So maybe you did start your life online. No, uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a hologram me that I'm sending to Iowa uh, in, a, in a flatbed truck. Yeah, that's real. He's somewhere. made a hologram, the Tupac, uh, a, the Tupac hologram. Tupac right? hologra hologram. <laughs> so I had this whole discussion with my team, whether you pronounce it hologram or hologram. All right, so let's try this. Raise your hand if you think it's hologram. Hologram. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I was the only one on my team that said hologram, and it turns out that both pronunciations are legitimate. Anyway, just letting you know. Um, so <laughs> according to Mary Webster. So, yeah, so I started my life uh, offline. Uh, you know, my parents are immigrants to this country. Like, uh, how many of you are immigrants or children of immigrants? I'm going to guess it's a pretty high proportion. Yeah. So, you know, like many of the people in this room, I uh, grew up uh, son of immigrants. Uh, certainly never thought I'd be running for president. Uh, if, if this country had its shit together, I would not be, truthfully. Yeah. Well, it sounds like the, uh, the online support is translating to the real life world. You know, that, that's one thing that, it's like, there, you know, there are human beings behind most of the social media. Yeah, the fact accounts. that you're, you're being split, your time is split to the point where you're commissioning holograms is like kind of intense. Yeah, yeah, you know, it's true. I have two jobs. One, win the White House. Two, stay married. If I do those two things, I'll be well. All right. Uh, so how can people support you? Uh, so if you'd like to support us, uh, we, do, we do accept crypto at yang2020.com slash crypto, so you can do that. That's good fun. Uh, but you can make a contribution in, in dollars. The average... Yang Gang members only donated $19, so I joke that this is a very cheap gang to join. <laughs> um, but would certainly love your support. Um, you should know that you have a friend in me in the campaign. Like, uh, I believe that uh, the blockchain it needs to be a big part of our future, and we need to help create an environment that makes sense for you all so you can continue to do the, the work that you're doing. I know the work you're doing sometimes is very, very difficult. It's isolating. Some people don't understand what you're doing. Uh, but it is the future. You all reflect the future. I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. And if I'm in the White House, oh boy, are we going to have some fun uh, in terms of the cryptocurrency community? Because then we're, we're going we're to see where the valuation goes with President Yang in the White House. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, all right, I think that kind of wraps us up. Let me take a question or two. I always feel bad if I didn't get a question. Caroline, just because uh, I you know. Yeah, go shout it out and I'll repeat it. Um, I would love to hear, this is a very international debate in crypto. Um, what do you think is the best way to bring the conversation to more So, 
My friend Caroline's asking, what, what do I think the most important foreign policy priority is uh, as president? Uh, and I would say the biggest existential threat is climate change. It's looming, it's accelerating. The four, the four last years have been the four warmest years in recorded history. Uh, right next to my math hat at home is a science hat. Uh, and we need to get our arms around it. The, the tough part about it is that the United States is only 15% of global emissions, so a lot of American discussions seem to suggest that if America were to go renewable, then it would uh, immediately uh, sharply reduce the rate of climate change, which may or may not be true. You know, it's like if, if you reduce that 15% to something much smaller, and the rest of the world keeps burning the way that they are, uh, it may not slow climate change that much. Um, so that, that to me is uh, our, our biggest priority. Uh, I, I'll say that to me, our foreign policy reflects how we're doing at home, and the United States is not doing well at home. Um, our life expectancy has declined for the last three years due to drug overdoses and suicides, overtaking vehicle deaths. 78% uh, of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. It, it's a rough time here in the US. It's why Trump's our president. And then our foreign policy now reflects that. So we have to reconstitute our communities here, and then we can become a much more reliable partner and ally abroad. Um, in the sunglasses, yeah. So the question's about the U.S.-China trade war, uh, and again, very politician-y, but I was just with a farmer in Iowa, uh, and, <laughs> no, it was, it was really me. Uh, and it'd be funny, some farmer talking to a hologram, being like, <laughs> uh, though the hologram can hear. Uh, and the farmer said to me, he said, he spent six, year, six years building a trade relationship uh, with a Chinese buyer that then got abandoned because of the tariffs, and he was furious. And he was like, I spent six years in that relationship now, I have no idea if it's ever gonna come back. So uh, to me, the, the trade war ends up hurting uh, businesses and consumers on both sides, uh, and would be, to me, the very last resort if you're trying to help uh, correct imbalances in, in a trading relationship. And if you were, were going to declare tariffs, you should give people months or years in advance so you don't have people having to build up investments like this farmer did and then fire people and like, uh, and, you know, shell the investments. I would be furious. As someone who's run a business, if you changed the prices on me after I'd planned for months or years in advance, I would be so angry. Uh, and that's happening to uh, businesses and, and workers on both sides. So this to me is like a last resort. I will say I'm a bit of a cult hero in parts of Asia. I don't know if any of you are from Asia and can verify that. No? <laughs> yeah, they're different. So the, the hope is that, um, so it, it's pretty funny. The Chinese news services took like three days to figure out what they thought of uh, Andrew Yang's candidacy for the White House. And then they decided to make it front page news in China and like, and like all these other. So I became like a cult hero in China. Um, and so if I were to win, I have a feeling that the Chinese would want to uh, make friends and at least have some, some positive relationships to see if we can't, uh, we can't cooperate on climate change, on AI, on, on the issues that the U.S. and China need to come together on um, in order to, to help manage the future in a way that we'll all be excited about. Right, Last. Okay. Unfortunately, oh, wait, that is the all the time All right, guys, sorry about that. That go. was me off script. Right, thank you, thank you very, very much. <laughs> it's a pleasure. Thank you all.